Thanks, Christine, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Christine mentioned, my name is Krista Sherman. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the University of Exeter, and uh, my research forms part of this larger collaborative project to address conservation needs for NASA grouper. Uh, so one of the aims is to look at the population structure and dynamics of these fish. So what is a NASA grouper? Um, luckily, Christine helped to set up this talk for me. Um, but essentially, it's a large predatory reef fish that's endemic throughout the tropical western Atlantic, uh, the, the Caribbean, and parts of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it's a long-lived species, uh, it's separate species, it's, it's, sorry, it's separate sexes, gonocharistic, um, and really long lifespan, up to 29 years. Um, and as Christine mentioned, this species has experienced drastic declines in the population over the last three decades and declined by about 60% globally. Um, so the IUCN now listed as a, an endangered species. And more recently, the US has identified NASA grouper as a candidate species for listing under the Endangered Species Act. So in terms of the life cycle, as Christine mentioned, this species has both a pelagic stage and a benthic stage. Um, so these fish, sorry, right here. Um, as adults, they're normally solitary, as she mentioned, and then they migrate off from their home reefs to these spawning aggregation sites for the purposes of reproduction. And as she mentioned, that is an entire reproductive effort for the species uh, that's concentrated. And these larvae get released into the water column, and the average pelagic larval dispersal stage is about 42 days before they actually recruit back onto uh, appropriate um, nearshore nursery habitats here. And then they go through these ontogenetic habitat shifts um, until they're um, adults back on these deeper four reef systems. Uh, so what I want to spend a little bit of time on now is talking a little bit more about these fish spawning aggregations that you heard about, um, because it's one of the more exciting aspects of grouper biology. So I'm going to just play you a little video. If I can get this to work. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is a picture from one of the spawning aggregation sites that we've been monitoring since 2010 off of Long Island. Um, and as you can see, during the day around the winter full moon, you have these hundreds and thousands of fish um, gathered at these sites, and they're here to reproduce. Go through all these different color phases. There are three different color phases associated with their reproductive behavior and courtship. Uh, the bicolor, white belly, and, and barred, uh, uh, dark phase, sorry. Um, and you'll see in the video in a second, there is a large charismatic megafauna uh, that moves through. So right here is a bull shark uh, moving through the aggregation. So these fish, um, around sunset, you'll have smaller groups breaking off um, and going through these false spawning rushes and actual spawning rushes, um, and then settling back into the population here. Unfortunately, the predictability of where these spawning aggregations occur and when they occur is one of the reasons why this species is particularly vulnerable. Um, and it's one of the threats, particularly, is uh, overfishing. So at the spawning sites, as Christine mentioned, we see a number of fish in traps. About 20 to 30 percent of the fish that we see at spawning aggregation sites are often caught uh, in these fish traps. Uh, other threats to the species include lionfish and other invasive species, as well as coastal development, which disrupts a lot of those nearshore nursery habitats that are important for grouper um, through different parts of their life cycle. Uh, so in terms of fisheries and conservation management in the Bahamas, there are a number of um, interventions that have been made. Uh, there is marine protected areas. Um, one of my favorite marine protected areas, Eric always teases me about this, referring to it as the park. Uh, but the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park was created back in 1958 and became a no-take marine reserve in 1986. Um, and then in this park, some of the work has shown that the biomass of grouper here are substantially higher inside the park and that decreases significantly as you move outside of the park. And Craig will be talking more about some of this work tomorrow, uh, where we do see this effect uh, with uh, healthier densities of NASA grouper and other commercially important species inside the park um, compared to outside the park. Um, other regulations include size limits. So there is a three pound size limit for NASA grouper. That's about a 45 centimeter total length fish. Um, these species 
uh, are sexually mature between the ages of four to eight, although we're seeing uh, fish not making these migrations until about seven years old when they're um, 50 plus centimeters in length. Um, there have also been a, num a number of closures, uh, both specific to some of the spawning aggregation sites like Haiki, as Christine just mentioned, um, but also seasonal closures as well. And as of last year, we have a permanent seasonal closure for Nassar grouper. Um, but despite all of that, what we're seeing is a decline in fisheries landings from a peak of about 500 um, tons uh, in uh, 1997. Um, and that's been over the last 20 years. So there's been a significant decline in grouper landings in the Bahamas. So why is this happening? Um, a part of this is due to unsustainable fishing practices um, and illegal fishing during the closed season that happens that we observe every year. But what's happening in areas like the no-take marine reserves, like the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, where densities of grouper um, have been shown to be significantly higher than outside the park. So this is some data taking a closer look at the park. Um, and if you notice, over the last 11 years, so from 2003 to 2014, there's been an 84% decline in the numbers of Nassau grouper, even inside the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. Um, there are possible reasons for this. Uh, one of it is due to fish migrating outside of the park to these spawning aggregations. So some of the work that Craig has done has shown that fish migrate outside of the park to reproduce. Um, but other work has shown for other species that actually recruitment um, into the park, so new uh, larvae coming into the park may be low. So the park is acting as a source, um, but there's you know, that source sink dynamic relationships, there's not a lot of new uh, input coming into the park. So what can be done? What are some of the traditional approaches that are being used? Um, in the Bahamas, this takes the form of monitoring assessments, um, both for habitats for the species, so your reefs, seagrass areas, through belt transect surveys, um, but also monitoring the actual fish spawning aggregations through a combination of these roving diver survey techniques and belt transect surveys. Uh, there's been an attempt to uh, create a stock assessment model that Christine talked about earlier, but that was in ground truth, ground truth. Um, so there's more work to be done. And then fisheries landing data, which is used sort of as a socioeconomic uh, guide in terms of what's happening uh, with the country. And um, in recent times, these tagging studies, um, both the external floy tags that are used, but also the, the internal tags, the acoustic tags, to look at migration patterns, which is something um, that we know very little about for this species in the Bahamas. But these approaches have challenges. One is that they're really, really time consuming. The Bahamas is really expansive. This is a lot of area that we have to cover. And these approaches take a lot of money, um, which we don't have a lot of. <laughs> so these are really challenging. So another biological approach to address some of these issues is looking at population genetics. Um, and genetic analysis is essentially the building blocks of fish populations. Um, so each fish has well, we're externally tagging these fish and internally tagging them, but fish have their own internal DNA, and that's their basic, their internal tag um, that we can use, and that can be used to gather a lot of uh, ecological insight about these species in terms of advancing them and also helping to prioritize conservation management for these species. So there are a suite of tools and benefits to using this approach for fisheries management. Um, and helping informing decisions. And we've heard a lot about this week uh, through some of the seahorse talks yesterday about how that can be used for species identification, um, looking and understanding about genetic diversity patterns, uh, sex and age determination, more understanding of population structure and dynamics, including where are these fish coming from, how many breeders are in these populations, uh, what's the effective population size, uh, understanding relatedness of individuals among these spawning aggregations and these source sink dynamics to better uh, facilitate uh, marine protected area design. And uh, in the future, aquaculture is something that uh, a lot of people are interested in, but we need to understand the genetic implications of some of these restocking initiatives um, before they're um, really taking off. So what do we know about uh, 
the status and populations of NASA groupers in the Caribbean. So from some of the work that Craig's done again, we know that some of these species exhibit site fidelity to these uh, spawning aggregation sites. And uh, one of the more comprehensive studies at the genetic level uh, was done a few years ago by Alexis Jackson. Um, and she used a suite of molecular markers, including mitochondrial DNA, uh, microsatellite analysis, and SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, to look at genetic uh, connectivity and variation uh, in terms of population structure throughout the Caribbean. And what they found is that there seems to be uh, low dispersal um, and a barrier potentially to gene flow here, uh, and this is in the exumas, and they hypothesize that the Bahamas populations of grouper um, may be self-sustaining. But the sample size that was used for this particular study is really low, um, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done. As Christine mentioned, in the Bahamas, uh, we have a number of spawning aggregation sites, and we know really very little about the status of these spawning aggregation sites. So this is a map of the Bahamas, um, and as Christine mentioned, uh, the Bahamas contains most of the spawning aggregation sites in the world. There are reportedly 80, and we have up to 40 of those. Um, but most of them, we don't know what the status is. There, for a few of them, there seem to be relatively healthy, um, but for some of these that are in red here, um, they're in decline. So some of these spawning aggregations have actually collapsed uh, in terms of uh, being able to sustain commercial fisheries. So the aim of this work uh, is to assess the population structure, the status and dynamics of Nassau grouper uh, in the Bahamas. And specifically, we're looking at genetic diversity and connectivity of this fish throughout the country. And we're also interested in examining fine scale patterns of genetic variation within some of these spawning aggregation sites, because this is work that has not been done before. Uh, so in terms of the methodology, um, using two uh, molecular markers, DNA microsatellites or simple sequence repeats and uh, SNPs, and you've heard a, a little bit about that uh, this week, and I'll explain more what uh, microsatellites are in a minute. And um, these samples for these analyses are being uh, extracted by two methods, hot shot for the microsatellites and, SNP, uh, and DNA uh, chiogen extractions for the SNP work. And we're also partnering this with uh, some of the roving diver survey work that we do during the spawning period. So, so far I've completed 111 uh, DNA extractions and these fin clips have been uh, acquired through our spawning cruises, um, but also through partners that are in the audience today. So uh, thank you to Brief, CEI, um, we have a uh, friend to the environment that will be involved and a number of other organizations that have been helping to obtain fin clips. Um, and these samples are then assessed uh, for quality to make sure there's DNA in there. Uh, there are species specific primers that have been developed for NASA grouper and those get tested. Um, once they're tested, uh, PCR is used to amplify the DNA and then I sequence them with um, a Beckman sequencer. Uh, those samples are then scored and rescored with, with the microsatellite loci, and we get um, data from it, which could be used for analysis. So I'm not as far as I'd hoped to be at this stage due to field work being what it is uh, and weather not always cooperating. Um, but so far, what we are seeing is there is a pretty good size range in terms of the alleles and uh, the number of alleles per locus. So the size range here from about 118 up into 370 base pairs um, and anywhere from 13 to 24 uh, numbers of alleles uh, per locus. So in terms of preliminary results, what is this looking like in terms of population structure for the Bahamas? This is just based off of 56 samples. Um, so after the sequencing, uh, some of the samples fail to amplify properly, so I need to resequence and do some more analysis. Um, but you can see here from this PCA plot that's used to visualize uh, similarities and dissimilarities uh, that there is no clear clustering or population structure for the samples that we have so far, um, most of which have come from Andrus and Long Island. Uh, we have just a few from the Exumas 
and one from the Berry Islands. So there is a whole lot more work to be done. And uh, the questions that I'm hoping to address is whether or not subpopulations of grouper actually exist in the Bahamas. Um, if there is genetic differentiation uh, within these spawning aggregations, and has the genetic composition of these fish been compromised due to uh, overfishing? Um, and this has important management implications, uh, especially for areas like the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, and also for the next 10% of marine protected areas as the Bahamas is part of this Caribbean Challenge Initiative. And really it's critical for us to uh, have effect, fish, effective fisheries management. Uh, we need to understand uh, the interspecific differences of these popula populations and the current dynamics uh, in order to effectively manage the fishery, have a sustainable fishery, um, and help to reverse the decline of Nassau grouper in the country. Um, so I think I'm out of time. So I just want to acknowledge all of the collaborators um, that have been involved with this project, helping uh, us with our field season, helping to provide samples, uh, and, and the people that helped to get me here for this conference. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to contact me later or follow us on Facebook. Thank you. <laughs>